Okay, good afternoon and good evening colleagues. A very warm welcome to the launch of our new global report, Delivering Girls Education Where the Risks Are High, 10 Key Priorities for Programming in Fragile Contexts. My name is Dr. Akila Datu, and I'm thrilled to be your MC for the day. Following on our conference and workshops hosted in March 2021, where we listened to our partners, government representatives, donors, and implementers reflect on what has been achieved in girls' education in fragile contexts, our continued challenges and opportunities, I am honored to host this event where we will launch our global report outlining 10 key priorities for girls' education programming in fragile contexts. Just some quick housekeeping rules. There will be a point during the conference where we will solicit questions from the audience. Please use the Q&A chat box at the bottom of your screen to insert your questions there. As we have limited time, we will hand select a few for the panelists to answer and will endeavor to respond individually to the remaining questions during the event. When posting questions, please do feel free to add your name and organization or enter the question anonymously, the choice is yours. Without further ado, it gives me immense pleasure introducing you to our first speaker, Dr. Andrew Cunningham. Andy is the global co-lead for education at the Aga Khan Foundation. He holds a PhD and master's from the University of Oxford in comparative and international education and has been with AKF since 2015 at its headquarters in Geneva. Prior to AKF, Andrew co-founded an all-girls secondary school in rural Kenya and worked for UNICEF Kenya in designing and implementing multi-year education systems strengthening programs with FCDO and GAC, et cetera. Andy, over to you. Thanks, Akil, and welcome everyone. I have a wonderful opportunity to try to take a 50-page incredible report that collectively synthesizes insights and innovations from 200 participants and try to walk you through some of those key takeaways in the next 10 minutes. So apologies if my remarks are brief and if it also feels like a tour de force because this issue is among the most critical issue that we face in the global education sector um, for the next, not just next decade, but for decades to come. And I wanna begin within the report, Alicia Herbert, FCDO's Director for Education, Gender and Equality stated, in fragile contexts, girls face a triple crisis of learning, gender inequality, and insecurity or displacement. And that makes it more difficult for them now than ever to access education and stay in school. Thankfully, across many different workshops and across many different panels in March of this year, practitioners came together from various countries and various projects to offer really candid and really actionable advice about how we may move forward in the direction of supporting the next generation of girls and boys in fragile contexts. So we have these 10 key priorities and let me kick it off with the very first one. Move beyond the three-year cycle, providing predictable long-term education funding. Joseph Hu Ho from the Catholic Relief Services who's on the panel later in today's workshop, said that building a government that can effectively deliver basic services takes time. NGO supported services should aim to fill gaps where governments cannot deliver. Often these are remote places that are difficult to access due to barriers such as security and geography. And if you don't have a sustainability challenge at the end of the project, you probably weren't targeting the right communities and were possibly doing a job that the government could have done. Within this first priority within the report, we highlight the case study of the SCDO funded Girls Education Challenge, launched in 2012 as a multi-year commitment to ensure that girls in some of the most poorest countries in the world are receiving a quality education. And now in its second phase, as most of us know, it is supporting 41 projects across 17 countries. Two key takeaways here, coordination with among donors is key and thinking about projects in the lifespan 
of a girl's cycle of education rather than the beginning and end of a particular project. The second priority challenges us to allow space for agility. And how might we promote more rapid adaptation to ensure successful learning outcomes? We highlight a case study called Project Lahar in India. And it was in collaboration with UNFPA and the Aga Khan Foundation. And it was trying to enable adolescent girls with the skills to create income generating opportunities. And the first set of skills were about tailoring. But after a rapid market analysis, it seemed that perhaps alternative ways of addressing some of the barriers for generating income could be addressed in other types of skilling. And actually mushroom cultivation in urban settings was established as a response to more in-depth analysis of the current market that not only responded to girls being incredibly mobile in urban settings, but also that market chain that could have a sustained income over time. This provided an example of not only how donors could establish more responsive and flexible funding, but enabling projects and programs to reforecast, pivot, adjust. And because of that flexibility from UNFPA, the program was able to address critical needs that girls were facing and also create models that have also gone on to sustainable impact. Priority three also challenged us to elevate her voice, designing education programs from the girls' perspectives themselves. The case studies that emerged from the conference included that from Action Aid in Kenya, targeting out of school girls, where they've employed a six step approach that has been adapted from Action Aid's community led participatory change plans and allowed for the design of addressing specific subgroups of girls' needs in planning how they might come back to school and stay in school. For example, during COVID-19, meals have been provided for young mothers so that they may be able to actually attend classes and catch-up classes. Whereas before, the time spent being preparing meals and having that kind of responsibility at home prevented them from coming back to school. It's a small example of a very big opportunity of actually listening to these subgroups of girls that are more marginalized than others in our quest to be able to have quality education for all. Other subgroups include marginalized girls that have disabilities, perhaps do not know the language of instruction, and as mentioned before, the young mothers. Ultimately, girls' education programming should place girls and women at the center of the solution and enabling the views and needs from women and girls themselves actually begins to create a sense of ownership and also beginning to flip this notion that programs place girls as subjects for interventions rather than giving them voices to speak, share their experiences and build their confidence. And one of our attendees, Girls Rising, have done this by creating many documentaries in Pakistan and in India about how girls have broken down the barriers to achieve their dreams. And then these films are used as ways for gender sensitization programs within communities. It's these kind of practical, specific, and targeted interventions that not only create voices that matter, but also create opportunities that can sustain the change. Number four is to place communities in the lead, partnering with our key stakeholders to sustain education programs. Within our case studies in this section of the report, we highlight the success of the Step Towards Afghan Girls Education Success Consortium, or STAGES. And this is where our partners collaborated with communities to establish community-based education classes, or CBE classes. And within these initiatives, school management committees, or shuras, involved a range of trusted members of the community, including religious leaders who are responsible for promoting girls' educational outcomes. This approach, together with the local government authorities, ensured stages interventions were owned by the communities. But it also ensured 
the continuation of learning even during the COVID-19 pandemic. This lesson is universal. We have seen that the COVID-19 pandemic has shown the importance of local ownership of girls' education initiatives and the fragility of interventions when the community is not in the lead. Other examples in this section include CARE's approach to working with religious scholars to become champions of girls' education, where locally rooted approaches provide a more inclusive and effective approach in stressing the importance of girls' education within some very conservative communities. And also the work of grassroots soccer in Tanzania was highlighted about how soccer clubs could be brought as a practical and scalable model for promoting girls' empowerment and education initiatives run and owned by the communities themselves. And building on this also provided within the example of grassroots soccer in Tanzania is how might we as a global sector include the boys delivering education programs for all. A program by Save the Children in the Democratic Republic of the, Con Republic of the Congo called REALIZE, an acronym of a French program, had a realization moment that they shared with us. That in the first phase of the Girls Education Challenge funded program, they really focused most of their interventions um, for the girls. And this led in mixed um, secondary or mixed schools, mixed sex schools, um, that it led to more physical and verbal violence towards the girls by the boys. So in the second phase of the project, they pivoted, they replaced girls kits with class kits, including textbooks to be used by both boys and girls. They provided bursaries through a whole school approach. And they also published puberty books for girls and boys, which challenged gender norms and presented positive characteristics of boys and girls. CARE also provided a concrete example about their adolescent empowerment work in Somalia, where they have both girls empowerment forums and boys empowerment forums as a sex separated intervention where girls also are able to understand and wrestle with new gender roles in the fast changing society. And for boys also to envision different perspectives related to masculine roles in society and to have a space, a safe space to discuss the risks that they are exposed to when forced to prove themselves in the community as quote unquote men. These may include being recruited for militant groups, illegal migration for economic opportunities and even drug use. So although this is a very simple statement in our programming realities, we know that this is one of the most difficult to achieve. Number six is to prepare the classroom, supporting teachers to deliver effective gender responsive pedagogy. And the report from the different participants makes the claim that quality pedagogical approaches and gender sensitive pedagogy should be synonymous. And it highlighted the recent work by the Evidence for Gender and Education Research resource report called the 2021 Girls Education Roadmap supported by Echidna Giving and Population Council's Girls Center that emphasized how teacher professional development should be complemented by peer-to-peer -peer support, but also provided proven ways to provide impact on learning outcomes, either through structured pedagogy, use of instructional technologies, and competency groupings. The population in Kenya also provided a very exciting example about how school leaders have been engaged in policy dialogue to learn about the existing policies that support school re-entry for at-risk girls and reflect on the success and challenges. And in addition, AKF spotlighted its own inclusive learning environment guide to enable teachers to address biases within their own classrooms and also foster the attitudes and values needed to create a caring and loving and joyful learning environment. Priority seven challenged us to create more meaningful pathways, planning with a long-term view from education to employment. Save the Children piloted the Girls Learning to Teach program in Afghanistan, where they worked with adolescent girls in their last year of secondary education in order to become teachers. And the program has trained 265 teachers and has been received very well locally with communities applying for funding to incentivize female teachers and pay for their transport. Extracurricular and leadership training also were 
repeatedly re referenced about the importance of improving girls' confidence and levels of resilience moving forward. Female teachers specifically came up over and over again as an important aspect of creating meaningful pathways within the context where we work in fragile areas. Female teachers have an important position in communities as role models for girls. A lack of qualified female teachers is both a cause and effect of the low levels of education. Priority eight is to collaborate and build synergy, working in partnership at every level across multiple sectors for quality learning. Different examples from care in Somalia, and again, the stages program throughout Afghanistan, continually illustrated the needs for intersector collaboration. And in fragile contexts, education programming often sits at the nexus between humanitarian and development responses. But what may be the advantage of sitting at that nexus? And how might we also learn from other sectors such as early childhood development or the agenda around climate resilience that requires multi-ministerial approaches across education, labor, health, and development? Priority nine, challenges us about safeguard and protect. Adopting a forward-looking approach to safeguarding in and through education and moving beyond the box ticking exercise that often, that so often it becomes. And Tina Tin from the IFRC stated, solutions to sexual exploitation and abuse are found locally. And there was a claim within the report and from the participant that the education sector itself could take a more prominent and leading role when it comes to safeguarding. Not only working with communities to co-design and put in place reporting mechanisms that beneficiaries will feel comfortable to use, but integrating the competencies that young girls and boys need to be able to develop trust, to report instances of abuse, and to access the levels of support needed, where in areas that we work, there are very few case studies or examples of what happens after an abuse is reported. So what could we be doing in terms of creating that linkages with curriculum and what happens in the classroom, home, and communities? And finally, priority 10 is to think outside of the box, embracing complementary models of girls' education. The pandemic, of course, has only highlighted the importance of a wider mindset and a more ambitious spirit for the education sector. But we have learned through the conference and through our partners of different models that we've already seen work. For example, the primary school access through speed schools or Pass Plus project in West Africa, supported by um, the Educate a Child initiative. And it took a model that was developed by the Strom Foundation and West African education experts that offered a pathway for out of school girls and boys age eight to 12 to access and regain their enrollment into primary education. And in essence, it provided opportunities in the first two months in the local language, and then before switching to learning in the French model or in the French language. And in essence, covered three years of learning in nine months. And it was striking to understand that after over 115,000 children have participated, on average 90% of speed school students complete the program and 87% of those students transfer to primary school. And finally, within the stages consortium itself, the community-based education models have provided classes for girls where they live in their communities. The closer to the school a girl is, the more likely she is able to attend, to learn and to complete her cycle of education, enabling her to achieve and acquire those necessary knowledge, skills, attitudes, and values to become the next role models for the next generation of girls in and beyond her community. In the end, our experience shows that indeed change is possible. We think that every single organization and person on this call and also who contributed to this report have been doing some of the most heroic work against some of the harshest odds that we have faced. And we are thrilled to be able to present 
this report to the global community, but more importantly, continue our collaboration with the multilateral, the bilateral, the civil society, the INGO communities, and girls and parents and teachers and school leaders themselves to recognize that investing in girls' education in fragile contexts is not a decision that we should be taking lightly, but rather a decision that we absolutely need to continue to make in order to prepare the next generation of leaders for an increasingly uncertain world. Apologies for going over a little bit. Um, back over to you, Akila. Thank you. Thank you for that overview, Andy, and for capturing so well and as succinctly as possible, given the size of this report, all the key priorities identified. Um, we will now move on to our first keynote speaker, but before I do, just a quick reminder to please uh, put your questions in the Q&A chat box and Q&A function, not the chat box that makes it easier for us. So our first keynote speaker, Dr. Matt Reed. Matt is the Global Director for Institutional Partnerships for the Aga Khan Foundation, as well as the CEO at AKF UK. He has significant experience in strategic planning, operations and management, and nonprofit governance. Most importantly, Matt has provided us immense support and encouragement in pushing forward our agenda on girls' education. It gives me great privilege to welcome Matt to our conference. Matt, over to you. Thank you so much, Keila, and thank you all of you for attending. Thank you, Andy, for uh, that uh, whirlwind tour of the report, which I recommend everybody dig into uh, because Andy did a great job of giving you the highlights, but it is worth spending some time with it. And so thank you. Um, I'm really pleased to be speaking at this uh, side event of the Global Partnership for Education. Uh, I think, you know, I, I probably don't need to, but I'm going to remind everybody exactly why education is so important in this year. You know, we know that uh, over the past 16, 17 months of this pandemic, um, 1.6 billion children have been displaced and been out of school, half of them girls. And so I think if we needed any reminder of the urgency around that work that we are all doing in the field of education, that certainly provides it. And I think when you think that half of, uh, half of, of, of the, the children who were not in school were girls, when you think about the 170 million children that are estimated not to come back and that the vast majority of those will be girls, then the importance of today's Girls Education Summit as a side event uh, uh, really is, is very, very clear. We all know why girls' education is important in and of itself, uh, not only for, I think, moral and ethical reasons, uh, but also for the development reasons. So I don't want to belabor those points. What I do want to talk uh, with you about today is uh, how we can do more, how we can do better, and how we can live up to our commitment to truly leave no girl behind. And that's what this report and uh, our work under stages under the Girls' Education Challenge uh, and the work of so many of uh, the partners who are joined here on this call uh, has been about. Now, it's my privilege uh, to speak on this because my organization, the Aga Khan Development Network, has been focused on this sort of work for over a century. The first Aga Khan schools were founded in 1905 with the purpose of educating girls and boys. Um, but at that time, uh, the instruction was that if a family had to choose between sending a boy or a girl to school, they should send their girls. So I think that gives you a sense of how important we have always seen girls' education uh, and why for over a century we've been thinking about how to help girls learn better, help them live better, uh, and help them thrive. Uh, and really that's about helping them realize their potential and giving them better futures. In the last three decades alone, um, the, the Aga Khan Development Network has helped 10 million girls get in school, uh, stay in school, and I think very importantly, learn in school. And that's something I'll come back to uh, later, the, the importance of that. So today we're, we're living that legacy, working in 15 countries where we address uh, the, the needs of marginalized children of all kind, but, uh, kinds, but uh, especially girls. Now, as we think about the launch of this report, delivering girls' education where the risks are high, 
Um, I, I thought it would be worthwhile to focus just a little bit on the project that was our platform for engaging with this with uh, the other uh, uh, organizations of the Girls Education Challenge, et cetera. So let me say just a little bit about uh, the, the what's called the Stages Consortium. So this is the consortium of partners that Andy mentioned uh, for our girls education work in Afghanistan. Um, so Stages uh, brought together a number of partners uh, since 2013 in Afghanistan, uh, 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 offering or uh, bringing uh, uh, almost uh, 200,000 girls uh, into the education system in three quarters of the country. Uh, so working in 14 provinces uh, in places that are very, very conservative, some of them under Taliban control uh, uh, and, and others not. So really in a, in a variety of some of the most difficult circumstances you could have imagined there. Um, and we have had the privilege of leading that consortium, but I think really learning from the partners, as you will hear in this report. And so I, I want to um, mention those partners here because I think it's very important to cite them by name because uh, this is a, a collective achievement on, on the basis of all of them. CARE is one of those partners, Catholic Relief Services, Save the Children, the Afghan Educational Production Organization, the Aga Khan Education Services and the Aga Khan Schools, Roshan Telecommunications, and of course our colleagues at the Aga Khan Foundation in Afghanistan. Um, here it's worth saying that that work has been supported prior to stages by uh, several partners. We've been working on girls' education throughout our time in Afghanistan, supported initially by the Canadian government, um, also by the Swiss government, uh, and more recently by the UK government, which I think we should cite, it, it has shown real global leadership on girls' education um, and is one of the reasons that uh, there is an, uh, such momentum around this work. And of course, USAID, which has also supported this particular work in Afghanistan and has also lent its voice to a push uh, uh, globally um, around girls' education. Um, as I said, the results were impressive. 200, 210,000 uh, girls in 14 provinces, 170,000 boys, so 380,000 students overall. Um, to do that work, uh, and I think uh, uh, Andy mentioned this earlier, one of the, the, the founding principles of the work was that community engagement. And so as part of that, uh, they, uh, the, 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 the program has uh, engaged 7,000 mullahs or shura community members uh, around the importance of girls education to create an environment that could help uh, encourage and support girls so getting girls into school and helping them stay in school and i think that whole community approach is something that across all of not only our organizations in the stages program in afghanistan but all of the organizations working uh, uh, in fragile environments have cited the importance of engaging with communities and adapting to their needs, especially in fragile uh, or context, uh, uh, conflict contexts where the needs are shifting all the time. And so in or that's one of the reasons why some of the operational modalities that are emphasized in the report around innovation, around flexibility, around community responsiveness, I think most of all around giving voices to girls and listening to their needs are so important. Uh, and it's something that uh, together as a community, I, I hope that we take away as we think about the design of future programs, because that having that flexibility around those modalities is, is, is absolutely, absolutely vital. As Andy said, uh, this report builds on a conference that we hosted at the end of March with about 200 uh, participants. Uh, what's distinctive about that uh, conference, and I think therefore about this, uh, about this report, is that it brought together a diverse mix of, of practitioners, but also teachers from these countries, uh, experts, and of course donors, who are working in some of the most difficult environments around the world, some of the most fragile context, as we say. So in addition to Afghanistan, we had people working uh, in parts of Pakistan, in uh, front lines in Somalia, South Sudan, uh, the DRC, Northern Uganda, Mali, uh, etc. So really, we're talking about lessons that are that are uh, ground tested, 
This is a report that comes from the ground up. And I think that's something that's very, very important as we talk about approaches that are listening to communities, responsive to communities and responsive to the needs of girls. The organizations here are representing their voices. And in some cases, uh, we had represent that representatives from each of those groups, teachers teaching in Afghanistan, teaching in some of these places and, and, uh, and helping inform the conclusions of this report, which I think gives it special value uh, in the context of, of the work on girls' education. I think another distinctive aspect about the report is that this is a report that's not just focused on, say, education in emergencies. This is a report that's talking about how even in the most fragile and conflict-ridden zones, you can still actually begin building education systems, if you will, or beginning the foundations of a system that can eventually then be handed over to government. And again, as you hear in, the, um, in some of the conclusions around the need to work with government and engage with government, that long-term perspective and thinking about creating those pathways towards systems building in, in, in fragile contexts is something that's really, really important. And again, I think it's something that's quite distinctive about the organizations that have come together uh, to, to present this. And so, as I've said, uh, some of the highlights, some of the things that struck me as I was reading it, obviously, as I've already mentioned, um, putting communities in the lead. Um, and so uh, really uh, ensuring that's why this, the, 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 that um, when you put communities in the, in the lead and you really listen to them, you really engage with them, um, you do have to, uh, as I said, create modalities that can then be responsive to them. So if we're going to put communities at the center, we have to be able to be responsive to them once we've listened to them, because they will not feel listened to uh, if you haven't done that. I think that for me gets at a, at a, a, a core theme across a number of uh, the recommendations that are made, which is about building trust, especially in fragile contexts, and if, especially in places where there is conflict. It takes time to build that trust. Part of the trust comes through uh, listening to people, through engaging them, through being responsive through these adaptive responses. But it also, I think, uh, you, could, you also have to build that trust by delivering. So what do I mean by that? One of the things that our work has shown in Afghanistan, and I think lessons that we've learned from other places, is that parents have to have the confidence that if they send their children to school, they will be two things. Number one is that they will be safe. This is especially important for girls. The number of times and the amount of concern that there have been from whether it's the mullah or the father or the mothers uh, in these or the grandmothers uh, in, in the context of our program. So concerns about how will you ensure that our girls are safe when they're you know, uh, coming from the home to the school environment? How do we know that they'll be safe at school? What are the ways that you can ensure that they're safe there? Um, and then secondly, how can you ensure that once they're there, they're learning, that sending them there has value. And so that's why focusing on the quality of the education that's happening, as well as on their pathways beyond education, um, demonstrating to them that actually education will have a value, uh, not only in and of itself, but for family incomes, et cetera. And so for that reason, the report is recommending putting things like safeguarding at the heart of the work, not only because we have a duty of care to the people that we're working with, but because actually as a program modality, as part of building that trust with families, um, safeguarding is vital. If communities do not feel that their girls or their boys are going to be safe in schools, they won't send them. And so it's fundamental that you can create that uh, atmosphere of trust. I think the second thing then is also um, uh, uh, fundamental, which is quality. And too often uh, we focus a little bit too much on access sometimes versus what's actually happening in the classroom uh, where the girls, uh, where, and where and whether girls are learning while they're there. And that's something else that for me comes out of the report and certainly comes out of our experience. In conclusion, I want to leave the, 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 the panel to discuss 
uh, the, 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 the recommendations in much more detail. I think they're far more qualified than I am. But I wanted to spend a little time um, talking to you about some of the things uh, that, struck, that, that struck me uh, as I was reading the report. And most of all, leave all of us here with a collective call to action, because I think that the lessons of the report, not only do they deserve the attention, but they, they deserve action. And so I encourage all of us to use them as we're designing the next phases of our program, as we're having conversations with the communities that we're serving, but also with our donor partners and others. I think it's really important to stress that these are lessons we've learned in almost a decade, certainly the last, uh, let's call it uh, uh, eight years of experience under the Girls' Education Challenge, working in very difficult places. And it's told us something about what works. And I think the last point, I wanna pick up on something that Andy said at the very end, which is that these programs have demonstrated that progress is possible, even in the most difficult environments. And I think for all of us, we have to keep stressing that. And um, it's too easy often for policymakers and the public to dismiss um, the, the possibility of girls' education or even education, let's say, in either conflict scenarios or in highly conservative environments. And what our work collectively demonstrates is that it's not true. Progress is possible, it can be done, um, and uh, in a way, what, we're, what, we, what we've demonstrated is that we can create new horizons and new expectations about the possibilities for girls in the places where we've, we've been working. That's something I want to encourage all of us to continue doing. I want to thank you for the work that you've already been doing for this uh, and for your continued commitment to girls' education. Thanks very much. Matt, thank you for those very critical insights and for capturing the journey we've all taken resulting in this report. Now it's time to hear from our partners implementing girls' education in fragile context. After our panel discussion, we will take some Q&A from the audience at the end of the session. So feel free to add in your questions into the Q&A box, not the chat box, the Q&A box. Um, before I introduce you to our panel members, just a quick brief on what brings us all here together. ACAF and its partners, Save the Children Care and Catholic Relief Services, CRS, first came together to implement stages or steps towards Afghan girls' education success in 2013, which ran for five years, with support from the UK government's Girls' Education Challenge Fund. The project delivered a comprehensive package of interventions to ensure a sustainable ladder of learning opportunities for girls from pre-primary, primary and secondary levels through to teacher training and adult literacy across 16 of Afghanistan's 34 provinces. The initial program closed in 2017, but its successes led to a second round of funding from FCDO and USAID for stages two, another three and a half year program, and then the Leave No Girl Behind project, which is due to end next year. While we have worked together for eight plus years on stages, our partners have all implemented girls' education programs in other fragile contexts, leading to an incredibly rich collaboration. So let's bring on our panel members now. First, we have Emily Achessa. Emily Achessa is a senior education advisor in Save the Children. She provides in-country and technical assistance to girls' education programs and other projects in various countries such as Mozambique, Ethiopia, and Afghanistan. She holds a master's degree in conflict, security, and development. Welcome, Emily. Thank you, Akila. Hi, everyone. Hi. Our second panel member is Joseph Ho. Joseph is the head of programs for Catholic Relief Services in Afghanistan overseeing a portfolio of humanitarian and development assistance projects, primarily focusing on education, livelihoods, and food security. He has worked in a number of complex, fragile contexts since 2007, such as the DRC and the Lake Chad Basin area of Nigeria and Cameroon. Great to have you with us, Joseph. Thank you very much, Akila. Thanks. Our third panel member is Catherine Begley. Catherine is the Senior Education Technical Advisor at Care USA, where she has worked since 2015. She provides technical support to care country offices, local partners, and ministries of education around the globe, 
in designing, implementing, and monitoring evidence-based education and empowerment interventions for adolescents, particularly girls, including for several FCDO-funded projects in Afghanistan and Somalia. Welcome, Catherine. Thank you very much, and thank you for the opportunity to participate in the panel. Thank you. And finally, our last panel member is Rayana Fuzli. Rayana is the National Program Manager for Education Grants at AKF Afghanistan. She has been with us for around about nine years, managing numerous projects focusing on girls' education, adolescence empowerment, and ECD, and has led on the implementation of some very unique and successful pilots like the Girls in Science program in Afghanistan. Rayana, always a pleasure to have you here. Thanks, Akila. Good afternoon, everyone. Great, so let's dive right into this one with a very obvious question. It's been over eight plus, eight to nine years of working together to deliver stages in a fragile context, and it's now culminated in this global report. I'm sure it was not an entirely easy road. So Rayana, how about you tell us what practices, platforms, processes have worked well in fostering this partnership across these many consortium members? And also how COVID-19 changed the way the consortium worked together. Great, thank you. So our organizations that are working in Afghanistan, we are some of the biggest INGOs uh, and INGOs who are also competitors. Uh, and we provide very similar services uh, with very high levels of quality monitoring and similar program costs, especially with the MOE approving the unit cost for CBE. So while it hasn't been easy, <laughs> it hasn't been easy all the way, uh, we, we've somehow made it work. Uh, and not just for it, not just for stages, but we have PSA from USAID, we have Beacon from you know, the uh, Canadian government, we have SDC, this AQL project. So it's gone beyond stages. Uh, we've worked together in uh, four different uh, donors, four different consortium uh, over the last 15 years on CBE. Uh, and this is possible, firstly, uh, the, and one a really important point is the geography. We clearly outline where each partner is working. And while there are some small, there are some provinces where maybe two or more partners work in, we do first check the districts and work with the government to make sure that there's no overlap. We want to really prevent that. And I think that's really critical uh, in making sure that we work effectively together on the ground. Um, secondly, and another major important point is that we have the same goals towards education uh, and it is aligned with the ministry's national strategic plan. Uh, and that's that all Afghan children, girls and boys have access to quality education and have the knowledge, the no knowledge, knowledge, attitude, skills and values to be productive members of society. Uh, and because of that, we're able to overcome a multitude of challenges, which uh, during COVID was a particular, particularly big challenge and a good test of the consortium structure and how well we can work together as a team. Uh, and we were really forced to reevaluate how we approach and perceive distance education. It was seen as something that was not possible. It needed tech. There were a lot of issues and we really never thought it was possible, but we got together, we really put our brains, you know, on the ground and thought, okay, how can we do this? And it resulted in a totally new, innovative, offline, non-tech related approach to learning that enabled our CBE students to continue their education throughout all the lockdowns, the multitude of lockdowns. And we're talking about three school lockdowns uh, over the last year and a half. Uh, lastly, we work as partners not competitors, even though we are com technically competitors, we are more as partners. And because we're nonprofit, we're more open to sharing intellectual property. So um, like training packages, research findings, capacity building, and we don't face those additional costs if we had to hire each partner as a consultant uh, or work separately in our own field. Uh, so we, we reduce those costs. And then we also reduce that worry that by sharing all of this with partners, we don't lose our competitive advantage. Um, so I, I'd actually like to pass the question also to Catherine and see what her thoughts are on how we work together over the last eight years. 
Thank you, Rayana. When we were talking earlier about this question, I mentioned that I was uh, going to share a perspective that sometimes it's hard to surface, um, especially when there is a prime and there are multiple sub organizations working together. Um, certainly working with international and local organizations that share similar uh, missions and visions around supporting and advocating for at-risk young people, including girls, was very much welcomed as it provided opportunities for cross-learning and collaboration on technical approaches and adaptations and other deliverables, um, especially when done through formalized working groups that were led or co-led by consortium partners. Um, you mentioned, for example, the learning that took place around remote, uh, using different remote modalities and the inputs that the consortium partners were able to provide or put our heads together to discuss the best way to reach uh, children to minimize learning losses and to ensure uh, they were receiving uh, psychosocial support during the, the pandemic and multiple rounds of school closures. It's a very good example of where the consortium, I think, worked well together. Working with consortium partners has also grown CARES knowledge and provided us with opportunities to share our knowledge around the challenges and opportunities around education system strengthening, given the project's longstanding relationship with the Ministry of Education and the investment in building relationships uh, with high turnover within different ministries and departments. So we were grateful for the opportunity and continue to be uh, grateful for that opportunity to work together. The COVID-19 pandemic and the need for projects to adapt different modalities and monitoring tools and to address different human rights issues that were exacerbated by the pandemic resulted uh, on occasion in foregoing some of the established practices, platforms, and processes that allow for timely sharing of information, drafting and finalization of deliverables, and collaboration and co-learning. For example, I mentioned these technical working groups and uh, throughout the life of the project, uh, the benefits of engaging on those working groups, there were some lost opportunities to learn from one another and to collaborate on the creation of joint products. Moving forward, I think there's value in establishing and using a formalized reflection process independent of the RAM at least once a year on what's working and what's not working in terms of practices, platforms, and processes to foster partnerships across consortium members and around contingency planning for these emergencies like the pandemic posed for, for all of us. There's also a need for greater clarity around the handover process in response to staff turnover, including at the leadership level within the PMU and a periodic revisiting of ways of working and modalities for sharing information and for collaborating to ensure that all partners are clear on how to flag concerns and to have their needs heard, especially among subpartners. And finally, identifying and securing buy-in around tools that are user-friendly for all consortium partners to share information and for knowledge management for co-creating and reviewing deliverables and providing timely updates on how work is advancing to improve efficiency in the completion of deliverables and for discussing questions and revisions in real time, which fosters learning uh, and builds stronger relationships I think are warranted. Thank you, Catherine. Thank you for those lessons and recommendations, much appreciated. So let's now pivot to the key priorities outlined in the report. One of the first recommendations the report outlines is providing predictable long-term funding, much like the Girls' Education Challenge. How can donors, donors shift towards longer-term funding to allow more time to promote systemic and social norms changes without fostering increased dependency on communities of communities on donor aid. So how can we have long-term funding and not make communities dependent on donor aid? Emily, why don't you take this question for us? Thank you, Akila. 
Um, yes, indeed, I do realize, and we all do realize that predictable long-term funding covering the full cycle of girls' education is key for conflict and crisis-affected context in order to achieve life-changing breakthroughs. Funding should be adjusted to respond to adaptations, especially during emergencies, and we've seen that during COVID-19, uh, uh, different crises like the cyclones in uh, Mozambique, floods in certain other countries. So donors being open and also implementers being open to learn from what works, but also what doesn't work. And the Girls Education Challenge funding has aimed at exactly that. Uh, it has been supporting us to do a lot of work around different areas from the onset, although towards the end, we witnessed a huge budget reduction in some of the projects, and we all know the reasons why. Donors can shift towards longer term funding by intricately balancing various approaches. For example, starting with system strengthening, continued funding for interventions and processes that contribute or align with national education st uh, situation analysis, uh, that is drawing heavily from what implementers and international and local organizations are generating as evidence, as well as design and implementation of gender transformative education sector plans, the ESSPs. Of course, resource and uh, strengthening central and decentralized governments at local uh, and regional, as well as international and non-governmental organizations for the life of the ESSPs towards contributing to achieving government targets, especially where governments are unable to reach. And as you know, in some of the contexts we work, as uh, some of the earlier speakers said, the, there are contexts that are not reachable by governments and are occupied by different other groups or um, non-state actors or non um, state actors. For example, in Mozambique, we've ensured buy-in through our girls' education project called Star G, and ownership of the type three distance learning interventions that are contributing to government education plans in Mozambique, with the goal of this being scaled up and continued beyond the project. And these do bring uh, secondary education to girls and boys in the rural areas. This included working in close consultations and collaboration with the government, pedagogical university, and the Institute of Distance Learning. To this end, uh, we may take this may take time, but the end result is always important for sustainability. The next one is strengthening local NGOs, uh, civil society organizations, and community structures. That, as we have heard earlier, is key. Uh, to resource community structures that support girls' education and basic education as a whole, not forgetting that education is broader than girls' education and effectively enhancing uh, sustainability. Uh, investing in communities and training and capacity building of community leaders, community-based organizations, has is a proven way to reduce risks of dependency and ensure sustainability. In DRC, for example, through our Girls Education Project Realize, uh, we, we are wrapping up with some notable achievements in sustainability at community levels. The VSLAs and uh, RICOPES, which are child protection networks that we are supported to establish, learning clubs, uh, SRH clubs that are tied in with parents and caregiver sessions. These are low cost community models that do promote gender norms norms change in support of girls' education. Finally, it is critical to invest in hygiene education, climate change, activities in schools and communities. In Mozambique, again, we aimed at building the capacity of community structures that interventions were not only sustainable, but also rely on local resources. Uh, strengthening South-based research institutions and generous allocations to evaluations we must ensure that the North-South academic institutions are well-funded and resourced, and that the South-led academic practitioner and practitioner's research is valued and is drawing uh, uh, evidence to support some of the interventions, whether at local, national, regional, or international levels. We also must ensure dedicated, consistent funding to evaluations, as well as use of findings to inform education policy, strategy, plans, and budgets 
and uh, build in from design stage and ensure resource longitudinal, uh, ensure we are resourcing longitudinal evaluations. Effective donor coordination is also really important as you will see in the report where we are ensuring that we are silo busting, uh, donors are coordinated in conflict affected context and are pulling resources like uh, USID and uh, UK have done in the GEC in Afghanistan under stages two. And uh, lastly, as highlighted in our recent global policy position paper, let girls learn, uh, published by Save the Children, donors should provide more and better financing for girls' education through multilateral channels, including through ensuring the global partnership for education 2021-2022 replenishment of the 5 billion is fully funded. A fully funded GP will help transform education systems in up to 90 countries, making them stronger, more inclusive, and more resilient to future crises. GP also helps to leverage more better domestic financing as the most significant and sustainable form of funding for education. GP creates incentives for partner countries to increase their investments in education and improve equity efficiency and spending. Joseph, I don't know what you think about uh, this issue. Thank you, Emily. Um, I think you said it almost all, so I'll just maybe add a few points to complement. And uh, this is probably one of the priorities that I feel most passionate about. So I, I, I am uh, thankful for the opportunity to 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 add a, a few more points to it. I think, I, I think one of the things I would say first of all, education. Uh, oh, did we lose Joseph? Um. Oh, yeah. there you go. Sorry. Sorry about Go that. Ahead. Um, I, I was just saying uh, my connection had a problem. So I was just saying, I think um, I think one thing to recognize, first of all, of course, education is about uh, educating children, which is in itself a multi-year effort. But I think it's also important that there are two aspects when we talk about education programs that, that require real-time commitment uh, to make lasting change. And one is changing attitudes, behaviors, and practices. Um, uh, whether it's around, you know, support for girls' education or teachers' ability to manage classrooms. Um, and second, it's about increasing capacity at both the community and the government levels to sustain community uh, education access. And both of these things, I think, uh, yes, you might have a limitation in project cycle. Donors may have a certain uh, timeline, but these aren't processes that you can rush. And NGOs, we do have a role in, in our programs to catalyze these change, but um, they kind of run their own course uh, in, in, in their own timeline. And as much as you want it to happen within a two, three year time frame, these have often don't. And I think Matt has touched on some of these points already. It's about building trust. It's about building relations and buy-in and ownership from the community. Uh, and I would also add perhaps one thing uh, might not be the most welcome message uh, that donors want to hear. I think, uh, it definitely, fostering dependency is a real risk and concern that we do need to think about when designing programs, but I also think it's a bit of a loaded perspective. If you as a donor are intent on delivering a, a funding a project for two and three years, and we know that these kinds of changes require five to 10 years time frame to achieve then I mean, of course, you're going to see it as fostering dependency. But what I would argue here is maybe the big issue here is as a donor, you need to be readjusting your expectation on what can be achieved within the time frame that you've set out. Especially, I think this is very relevant in fragile context where everything takes much longer. Um, stakeholders and interests uh, are much more fractured and takes a lot of more time and effort to bring people together to real bring about real change. Uh, and I think all that said though, I do think that uh, stages, we're very proud of the achievements we've made in this area. And I think a big part of it is the, the eight years of commitment, uh, which really is a long time uh, that has allowed us to bring about these, these lasting changes. And uh, it, sustainability just takes time. You know, it's not something that can happen overnight. And uh, our, a lot of our, uh, our work has shown, you know, and Emily has mentioned, if you put the community at the center, if you really work hand in hand in, with the government in terms of planning, coordination, uh, you can ultimately achieve some degree of sustainability. And I think 
none of us will claim that we've achieved full success, but I think we have really taken a very intentional and thoughtful approach in putting the community and the uh, government at heart of this program so that we, at the end of the program, can achieve some degree of success. And we've seen that from our assessments where up to 60% of the girls who were handed over uh, to government school continue to study. Uh, and I think that's a major achievement in a place like Afghanistan where it's very difficult. And lastly, I would add, I think it's important also to take a step back and look at the achievements more broadly. I think it's easy to be sucked in when you're funding one program to another to say, well, when does this ever end? But even looking at Afghanistan in itself, in the landscape, I would say 20 years ago, uh, Rihanna mentioned PACE A, which was one of the first institutionally funded large education program in Afghanistan in the early 2000s. A lot of the focus was about enlarging, increasing enrollments, about access. So it's about creating community-based education classrooms everywhere you can so that you can get more children in school. But today, I think 20 years later, that's really evolved. Uh, yes, we continue to do a very similar kind of work in communities, but that tool of community-based education is much more refined now. And we're really using it to target very specific needs in areas that are very specific where the government really cannot reach because of security distance um, or other factors. And so I would argue that uh, if you take a step back, even though yes, we continue to do very similar kind of work, there has been progress made and there has been evolution. And I think it's important to keep that big picture in mind. Um, I'm, I'm gonna leave it here. I know we have a lot more other questions to answer. Thank you. Thanks, Joseph. Thanks for very honest responses there. So you did, you mentioned sustainability. So I want to just continue on that for a little longer because I know that's such a big topic for us, particularly as we're, you know, we're seeing increased episodes of insecurity all over. How did, how has stages defined sustainability? Emily, could you talk a little bit about that? Yes, thank you, Akila. Um, very quickly, I think uh, in the education, in the girls' education program, sustainability is all about delivering and enabling lasting, long-lasting girls' empowerment, whether we are talking about power to power with power within, uh, that contributes to the wider gender equality agenda, as we've heard from many other speakers in other sessions today, and through education for current and future generations. By working with girls and families and communities and schools and systems, we ensure sustainable change and impact is embedded in and within all the work that we are doing. And if we sustain and sustain, sustainability has been built in at the individual girl level and also within the enabling environment of change, including community, family, school, and all the systems that we are working with, as you've heard from the different speakers, ensuring a significant balance between building girls' academic skills but also knowledge and life and employability skills, especially where you have heard about our girls learning to teach uh, approach, uh, supporting female teachers in very difficult contexts where there are very few. System strengthening to ensure centralized and decentralized levels of government so that uh, money or funding is channeled through both long route and short route via the government and non-government organizations at the same time so that we can explore more in enlarging and expanding education for girls. Strengthening community structures, as we had said earlier, and linking these to community uh, and government schools, and especially through community child protection committees, but also parents, teachers, associations, school councils, school governance structures, and making sure they are all aligned and working together. And lastly, innovative ways of education, ensuring distance learning where we have seen hybrid and blended approach during the COVID-19, ensuring we are bringing in ed tech, whether high quality, low quality, but also sometimes no tech, where offline learning kits in context, uh, in context where online access is not possible, uh, especially learning especially lessons learning. from COVID-19 during uh, these school, mass school closures, if this happens again. Um, Thanks. Rihanna, I don't know what you think about this. Rihanna, you're on mute, by the way. Oh. Yeah, okay. Um, so yeah, I just want to give a sort of like a summary 
I, I think what Emily talked about is really important on how we define uh, sustainability now, but it might be good also just to point out how it's changed from stages one or even pre-stages, stages one and pre-stages, I would also say I had very narrow uh, definition of sustainability. The idea was always handover. Whenever you talked about sustainability, it was about how many classes, how many students, that was it. Um, but the context that we work in is not that simple. And so we really needed to, uh, under stages two, after you know we had some more deeper learning under stages one, we really thought about, okay, what is sustainability? Is it really just handover? Are we really just looking at how many kids, you know, transition and if that's the case <laughs> we're not doing that good uh, there's a lot of wrong there's still a lot to go for um so is it really reflecting the situation and the, the context that we work in and, and the answer is no so we really had to change the how we look at sustainability and make it a more dynamic and representative definition and especially how we measure it that way it's more accurate and it actually shows like Joseph is saying, there's so much being changed, there's so much happening, but when you look at it at such a micro level, it seems like nothing's happening, but you, when you step back a little bit and you really take in those different perspectives, uh, then you see how much has actually changed. So the, de the definition of uh, sustainability has really uh, changed into not just handover, but also changes in perception changes of community perceptions towards girls' education, especially adolescents, uh, especially safeguarding. We talk about child labor, early marriage. These are all things that we're looking to uh, improve on and CBE does that, CBE influences all of that. Uh, we also look at alternative pathways like SAVE's Glitter program or CARE's uh, paraprofessional or AKF, the way we adapted it, the paraprofessional program and looking at are there are there students that are maybe not choosing to continue their education, but they're still being productive members of society? Because re remember, our original goal is uh, not just access to education, but having children have the knowledge, attitude, values, and skills to be productive members of society. So there are other ways to do that besides having a 12th grade diploma or a you know university diploma. Uh, and then another way that we've also, uh, sustainability also, has changed the idea is um, how communities engage in education and not just sure as not just community leaders, but parents. So how do parents engage with their children at home and with home-based learning, we really saw what the possibilities were and where the gaps are and where we can really improve. And also um, how they advocate for education. So we also have a lot of great examples, especially from CRS coming out um, of communities and especially Badakhshan as well, communities going above and beyond the call of duty where they are traveling to Kabul, they're traveling, you know, on their own expenses to try to advocate for education in their, in their communities and, and how much of that is successful. Again, that is a, a more complicated question, but the fact that they're doing it and they're going for it and they're not giving up, that is a, that says, that says a lot about the areas that we work in. So. Thanks, Rayana. That was such a positive answer. Um, throughout the report, uh, there's this emphasis on empowering girls and elevating their voice, voices. Now, I can imagine that some would be concerned that as we empower girls, it would also increase the risks that they face. So, Catherine, what are you, your views about this? How can we increase girls' meaningful participation without increasing the do-no-harm risks to them? It's a very important question. And I'm glad we're discussing it. Um, to increase girls' meaningful participation in household and community life, they need to be equipped with critical knowledge and skills, including foundational literacy and numeracy, uh, leadership, and other life skills. And we know from various evaluations of uh, a variety of projects funded by FCDO, uh, among other uh, donors, that there's a relationship between the development of leadership and other critical skills resulting in changes in attitudes and behaviors that contribute to learning and improvements in girls' agency, uh, as well as uh, in learning outcomes in literacy and numeracy. That said, empowerment can't be achieved if it's the burden carried solely by girls themselves. Girls' empowerment efforts 
really require the support of power holders and influencers, changes in sociocultural and gender norms, and active participation, as many of the panelists and previous speakers have said, engagement uh, of communities as well as families and peers. Some of the approaches that have been effective in reducing risk for girls, especially in fragile contexts, include, I think Andrew may have mentioned it earlier at the beginning of the, the workshop, the involvement of religious leaders and community elders. They can serve as powerful catalysts for attitudinal change, and they have the potential to increase enrollment rates, promote regular attendance, and emphasize the need to address uh, dropout, especially as girls get older and advance or try to advance through school. And findings from a variety of evaluations funded by FCDO in Somalia and Afghanistan confirm this assertion. Um, if you want to learn more about some of the ways that the uh, religious leaders have been engaged uh, in under some uh, two projects in Somalia and, of course, under stages, I'm happy to share information later. We're under a time constraint, so I want to just go through a few additional uh, approaches. Um, another very effective approach to promote shifts in, in social norms uh, involves using synchronized approaches to adolescent empowerment through leadership clubs, and we see how those have been used in uh, two of uh, FCDO-funded initiatives that uh, are currently ongoing in Somalia. Uh, the leadership clubs include leadership clubs for girls, uh, called uh, uh, Girls Empowerment Fora, and leadership clubs for boys, called Boys Empowerment Fora. The GEFs seek to develop girls' voices and ability to work together in safe spaces and to explore new gender roles in a fast-changing society, including their potential for a different future after complete, completing school. In the uh, boys fora, the boys receive support to envision different perspectives uh, related to masculine roles in society and to have a safe space to discuss risks that they're exposed to and forced to prove themselves to the community as men. And these include being recruited by militant groups and illegal migration, search of different opportunities, as well as drug use. Um, another very important approach that uh, FCDO has promoted, uh, and we're still learning about its effectiveness, is the use of child, uh, child protection safeguarding mechanisms, standard operating procedures, and complaint case handling protocols while raising awareness around these. Awareness raising activities around child protection issues, which include around issues exacerbated for at-risk boys and girls during emergencies are essential, not only among project staff and teachers and school management, but also within communities and through functional platforms and structures such as school management uh, committees. So those are some, I could go on and on uh, about some of the evidence of how these approaches have been um, used and what we've learned about using them and the ways they've been adapted in different contexts, but I think these are some of the ones that immediately come to mind that I think have been especially effective in reducing risk at the same time, uh, helping to change mindsets and behaviors around what it means to, to empower girls. And we can have a long discussion about whether we're empowering the girls or whether we're helping facilitate their own actions and, and uh, behaviors that uh, ensure their empowerment. Thanks. Thanks, Catherine. I think that takes me into my next question around safeguarding. So um, I know that I actually see that the report highlights safeguarding as a key priority, but it's not actually often prioritized in programming. So Emily, could you just very briefly tell me what have been the biggest challenges in launching child protection and safeguarding within stages and what approaches have been used to address these challenges, if, if any? Okay, thanks, Akila. Yeah, that's correct. Um, child safeguarding has been a key priority in girls' education programming and programming in general, for that matter. And I think governments and donors need to ensure that there is appropriate resourcing of child safeguarding and uh, child protection, as these are often underfunded. The biggest challenge we have encountered in the past years, for example, is inadequate child safeguarding and child protection capacity skills and knowledge among girls themselves, 
their educators, the parents, the communities, local NGOs, and even the government. For example, uh, we've encountered poor coordination between referral partners to manage cases of abuse, mal uh, exploitation of children and adults at risk, low capacity of community protection mechanisms that uh, would help in strengthening child protection referral pathways and to refer cases quickly so that uh, they can be followed up and documented and also very low uh, non-government organizations at the local level capacities to support child safeguarding in these places. Um, I think it's really important that uh, the Girls Education Challenge has helped or through our different projects in DRC, Mozambique and Afghanistan when we realized that the challenge was bigger than we had planned, we had to go back to the drawing board and come up with a module uh, that would help in training the different educators at different levels, but also community structures that we were working with. And this was a multi uh, cross country module that was contextualized for the different countries that we worked with, but was also informed by the different uh, child safeguarding staffing and the countries that we've worked in, ensuring that we also establish referral pathways. And we also work very closely with the different arms that are supporting child safeguarding, setting up hotlines so that children, uh, girls, both girls and boys, and even adults can be able to call in in case they face any issues. Uh, making sure that we have focal points at different uh, community levels, but also linked to the district uh, centralized and decentralized systems and training partners, teachers and community councils to make sure that they understand what child safeguarding is. And finally, having code of conducts uh, that partners and community-based uh, education teachers can sign up to, training them on positive uh, discipline and what was exciting is just reading the evaluation, for example, from stages where a lot of stakeholders, from the girls themselves to the communities, the parents, the teachers highlighted how they now understand the importance of positive discipline and how positive discipline has supported girls and boys in different contexts to even achieve better learning outcomes, to be free to learn and uh, learn without fear. So it's really important to set up these systems and put them in place. Thank you. Thank you so much, Emily. So I just wanna very quickly, so the report discusses the need to invest in teacher professional development as the barriers and risk girls face in fragile contexts are often compounded and complex. So Joseph, could you just very quickly uh, elaborate on what methods stages have used that has shown the most promise of improving teaching quality and what exactly they were trying to address? Sure, absolutely. Uh, I think uh, so the results have shown that the teachers and stages outperformed in many in, in many uh, places uh, their government teacher counterparts. Uh, and I think a large part of it has to do with uh, us having really put in place a package that provided continuous professional development to teachers. And I think that's probably one of the major gaps before implementing stages, looking at the landscape in education. The focus has largely been one-time certification, getting teachers' credentials, and then that sort of ends there. And with stages, we've sort of, I would say, systematized an approach, a package of support for teachers that was continuous. So. It starts with the training, of course, the initial training, the orientation uh, on both subject material uh, content and pedagogy, but also uh, support that includes peer support uh, through uh, things that we organize, like uh, what we call teacher learning circles, where we bring teachers from a certain area together and they provide support to each other as a peer group, and also very dedicated coaching and mentoring from from uh, all of the partners teams uh, where they go in and do a in-depth classroom observation, provide real feedback, real-time feedback to the teachers, and then really working with them to address their, their weaknesses and build on their strengths. And I think that has been particularly powerful uh, in really improving the teacher quality. And I think the challenge there then is really, of course, how, how does a government uh, have the capacity to continue to take this on? And I think that is a real gap and real challenge. Um, that will take time 
but I think as there has been increasingly more initiatives, uh, both of course within the NGO side, but also within the Ministry of Education in Afghanistan, looking at how do we do teacher professional development better? Um, and I think a lot of the lessons that we've learned uh, within stages where we think of teacher professional development, not as a one-time thing, but really a continuous thing where it requires very punctual different kinds of support from different ways. Uh, if those things can also eventually be included on a policy level, uh, I think that would be very powerful in really increasing the teaching quality. My colleagues on the panel ha have much more technical background, so I think if others have questions, we'll be happy to answer them in the chat box. Um, but uh, I'll keep it brief. That's in short, I think, how we try to address this. Thank you, Joseph. Thank you. So I really want to continue this panel, but one final question and very briefly to the panel members. If you had to pick one of the priorities from the report to concentrate your effort on, which one would it be? Emily? Uh, okay, Catherine, which one would be your topmost priority? Well, it was really hard to choose. <laughs> Um, I think I chose a priority area three, elevating her voice, designing education programs from a girl's perspective, because I think successful girls education programming requires a deep understanding of the realities facing girls and the complex barriers they face to accessing and succeeding in education. And girls are best placed to know and to contribute to the solutions affecting them. I think that's especially, uh, in fragile context, but certainly in other contexts as well. Thanks, Catherine. What about Emily, now that you are here? Yeah, thank you, Akil. I was struggling to get my video on. Yeah, I do agree with uh, Catherine and um, elevating her voice or the girls' voices, designing education programs from the girls' perspective is really critical. I've attended so many webinars in the last few months and the webinars were girls from different movements from all over the world from Nigeria, Uganda, Ethiopia were speaking, they were so powerful and I think they impacted on policymakers. So we need to listen to the girls. They know what they're going through. They know what are the solutions and they have some of the most innovative ideas to feed into programming and into policy and plan development at all levels. Thank you. Thanks, Emily. Joseph? Uh, I would go back to what I felt very passionate before about uh, really uh, the priority of providing predictable long-term education funding, I think is critical. We have seen in uh, fragile contexts like Afghanistan, uh, donors are sometimes, uh, I think these days are seen to perhaps a little bit retreating from multi-year commitments. And I think that's very dangerous and at risk of reversing all the gains we've made in the past. Uh, and I think uh, the more predictable, the more long-term funding can be, uh, the more impactful our programs can be. Thanks, Joseph. And finally, Rayana, your priority. So I, <laughs> my priority would be um, number four, communities. Uh, we've seen through COVID and just general programming that you can't really get anything done without communities. And there's one specific group that we really haven't tapped into in terms of what they can do, and that's adolescents. Uh, we've worked with them, taught them, had peer groups, you know, done smaller things, but under our, another program that we implemented called uh, Improving Adolescents' Lives in Afghanistan Program, we've seen them achieve amazing, amazing work that has been sustainable, that they've continued to do on their own without any kind of financial incentive, program incentive, nothing. They're doing it on their own. So I think this is a really big opportunity for us to look into how we can work with these groups, uh, especially like on life skills and, you know, activities that empowered them. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you so much. Thank you to the stages partners for that lively discussion and for, for contextualizing some of the key priorities from the global report. It's always such a privilege to interact with, with the stages partners and learn from them. I'm, thank you so much for your honesty and insights. I would just love to keep chatting, but we have to move on. So I now invite Jehan Latrus to offer some final reflections and concluding remarks on girls' education in fragile contexts. Jehan is responsible for providing strategic advice and technical support on gender equality and empowerment of women and girls to education cannot wait country investments. 
So following a career with international organizations such as UNICEF and the IFRC in the areas of gender and gender-based violence and emergencies and development at, at field and global level, Jehan joined ECW in February 2021. So Jehan, over to you for some final reflections. Thank you, Akila. Um, I would like to start by thanking um, the Aga Khan Foundation for hosting this event and for releasing this important report outlining critical but also very practical and actionable priorities for girls' education uh, programming in fragile contexts. I would also like to thank the very inspiring panelists from CARE, Save the Children and CRS for their valuable insights on the contextualization of these key priorities in a number of contexts, um, including Afghanistan, where the STAGES program has achieved remarkable results in the past eight years, um, thanks to a very strong investment in community ownership and localization, as well as uh, robust collaboration and coordination as demonstrated by Catherine and Rayana during their intervention. Um, I just want to say a few words about Afghanistan, as it is a context uh, very well known to Education Cannot Wait. Uh, since 2017, Education Cannot Wait has provided support uh, through the first emergency response window. And based on the high returns evidence, it is currently supporting a multi-year resilience program um, investment to scale up the government's successful uh, gender responsive community-based education model which has reached close to 60% girls and improved access to safe and quality education for all, with a particular emphasis on girls and female teachers and the barriers they face. Um, the 10 key priorities highlighted in this report reinforce the key global commitments made through the SDGs, of course, particularly through um, SDG 4 and 5, uh, through the Education 2030 Framework for Action, the World Humanitarian uh, Summit, the G7 uh, Charlevoix Declaration, and the most recent declaration on girls' education launched during the G7 uh, last May uh, to provide quality, safe, inclusive, conflict-sensitive and gender-responsive education for all children, particularly the most marginalized girls and adolescent girls who face conflict, displacement, and natural disaster in addition to the devastating consequences of the COVID pandemic. Whilst evidence shows us that significant progress has been made in um, recent decades to close the gender gap in access to education in crisis and protracted crisis context, and that 180 million more girls have enrolled in primary and secondary educations since the Beijing Declaration and Platform for Action 25 years ago, significant gaps remain in fragile contexts as girls are twice as likely to be out of school than in non-conflict affected countries. These gains are now threatened by the COVID-19 pandemic, which constitutes an unprecedented setback on the achievement of the SDGs, not only SDG 4 and 5, but all the SDGs, with 20 million girls, particularly adolescent girls, who may never return to school and find themselves at heightened risks of child marriage, female genital mutilation, teenage pregnancy, gender-based violence, which all have devastating impact on the girls' safety, well-being, empowerment to reach their full potential, but also on their communities. As mentioned during this uh, panel discussion, in fragile contexts, female students and teachers are also at heightened risk of attacks on schools. According to a recent report from the Global Coalition to Protect Education from Attacks, armed groups have specifically targeted girls and female teachers and their schools in at least 21 countries between 2015 and 2019, dramatically affected their and their community's future development. As Andy said in his opening remarks, the more critical question the world has to address now and in the years to come is this very question. What works to advance girls' education in a world where 132 million girls are estimated to be out of school with over half of them located in fragile contexts. The 10 key priorities identified in the report and showcased today in this panel discussion particularly resonate with ECW's vision and priorities to advance gender equality and girls' education in emergencies and protracted crises. As the Global Fund for Education in Emergencies, 
and protracted crisis, Education Cannot Wait places gender equality and empowerment of women and girls at the center of all its investments. Our experience in the past five years, <coughs> sorry, excuse me, our experience in the past five years has taught us the importance of investing in quality teaching and learning and gender responsive pedagogy, as this is directly linked with improved learning outcomes for girls, as demonstrated by many of the speakers today. Investing in teachers' professional development is key, and investing in female teacher recruitment and retention is equally important in contexts where the lack of qualified female teachers is both a cause and an effect of low levels of girls' education, as highlighted in the session and in the report. The COVID-19 crisis has reminded, the, has reminded the world that education is more than school-based learning and that flexibility and adaptation of programs at the local level is essential. The community-based education modality implemented in Afghanistan through the MERC, for instance, the multi-year resilience program supported by ECW, lent itself quite well um, in, in, as a modality for reaching the most uh, marginalized, particularly girls, even in challenging circumstances, such as the COVID-19 crisis and the school closures. As pointed in the report, involving communities, caregivers, men and boys to support um, girls' education is essential for community ownership, social norms, and social norms change and sustainability. Community-based approaches need to put girls and their communities at the center and empower women and girls to make their voices heard. Meaningful participation of women and adolescent girls is essential in planning and monitoring processes, as well as in program delivery. And Education Cannot Wait is committed as part of its localization agenda to strengthen partnerships with local women-led organization through its multi-year resilience program investments. Scaling up investment in the education and empowerment of, of adolescent girls, including in market-based vocational training to enhance their skills, continues to be an important goal. We know that in fragile contexts, adolescent girls and young women have the lowest transition rates from intermediate level to secondary and from secondary education to training, as well as the lowest representation in employment. It is therefore essential for all education and emergencies actors to strategize on how to reach the most marginalized girls who are not in education, not in employment, not in training in the communities impacted by disaster and conflict. None of this can happen without an intersectional and holistic whole of child approach where learning environments are safe and inclusive and where a multi-sectoral approach bringing together the protection, safeguarding, mental health and psychosocial support, WASH and food security needs of all children are fully implemented. Providing such quality education requires partnerships across multiple sectors and across the humanitarian development nexus, bringing together governments, civil society, academia, donors, United Nations agencies, the private sector and others. As highlighted in the report, addressing gender inequality also means challenging deeply rooted harmful gender norms for, the, for a positive shift in values, beliefs, and practices. And as highlighted by uh, the panelists, this does not happen overnight. Social norm change requires a long-term, multi-sectoral, bottom-up bottom -up and top-down approach and can only succeed with crisis-sensitive, flexible, and predictable funding. Education weight Education Cannot Wait acts as a catalyst that brings together with flexibility and speed a wide range of partners across the humanitarian development nexus to place education at the center of the global public agenda and follows the need of people wherever they are. Let me finish by saying that ECW stands today by the Aga Khan Foundation and all its partners who took part in the preparation of this report to call for increased longer term funding from humanitarian and development aid sources for girls' education in crisis to enable gender responsive and gender transformative education to bring about sustainable change in the life of millions of girls, boys, and communities in fragile contexts over the world. Thank you. Over to you, Akila. Thank you so much, Jehan, for those incredibly powerful closing remarks and for emphasizing the need for a 
multi-sectoral approach to girls' education and empowerment. Here's where we conclude our event. I'm incredibly grateful to our speakers for their honest reflections on the way forward for girls' education, for your time and of course your passion. I also want to take a minute to thank Better Purpose, our consultant who supported in the development of this report. Thank you so much for your patience as we ensured that all the organizations could feed into this very complex report. As a global community, we all are aware of the urgency to prioritize and continue our efforts for ensuring all girls have access to quality education. Our hope is that this global report will support implementers, donors, and research institutes to invest in areas that matter and support in ways that will allow all girls to receive the education they deserve, no matter the context in which they live. We invite you to download and read our report, which will be available online after this event. Thank you immensely for joining us. Good afternoon, good evening, and good night.